Saturday afternoon here on the East Coast in the U.S., and that means it's time for a fresh outlook. Hello to all of our viewers from around the world. I'm Mia Toski. We begin this week's show with national news here in the U.S. Many people around the country and the world are puzzled by a story that happened in Arizona. Now, a New Jersey family was vacationing there and stopped off at a shooting range where a nine-year-old girl was given an Uzi to shoot for fun. As you may have heard, she accidentally killed the gun instructor. But the tragic story has many asking, at what age is it appropriate for children to handle weapons? Now, to talk more, we have my co-host and former White House aide, Dee Dee Benke. We have Robert Levy, criminal justice attorney, and Dr. Yohuru Williams from Fairfield University. And we welcome you all to the show, and especially you. Your first time for you, uh, Mr. Levy. Thank you. And it's Levy. Levy. I'm so sorry about that. All right? I'm glad you corrected me so I don't uh, make that mistake again. Right. Um, tr tragic story. Um, this, this story of this nine-year-old uh, shooting a weapon. Um, the first question I'm going to ask, just to uh, find out where you all stand, is... What age do you think it is right and appropriate for a child to handle a weapon? And we'll start off with Dee Dee. Look, I think the sooner the better, and it depends on the kids. This had nothing to do with the child or the parents. This was the instructor. I mean, talking about shooting yourself in the foot, but this time it was the head. It, he just didn't do his job. So, you know, it was bad judgment, but really, I mean, you know, he, he's the culprit here, no one else. And, not, and it's, it's the people, not the guns. Well, uh, a lot of people were appalled to see a little girl in pink shorts, um, and these are just some of the different uh, Facebook postings, in, in pink shorts, shooting a weapon of that cal kind of caliber. Uh, Mr. Levy. Well, I think that the problem lies with the parents as well as with the instructor. I mean, not only are we talking about training or at least allowing a girl who may not have had any training at all to use an automatic weapon, but there was no type of finding as to whether or not she had the capacity to be able to handle that wedding, we weapon. He was handling it with her, though. Well, it doesn't it's matter, does it? it? Well, it he really messed up. No, no, my point is he messed it up. I mean, it was, I don't think it was the parents' fault. He well, screwed up. Well, the parents up. said, uh, we're going to allow our daughter to have an Uzi. Great. The question is, do we know whether or not that daughter and the young girl had the capacity to hand to a handgun versus an Uzi? And we certainly want to uh, go into that a little bit further, um, but we do want to check in with you, Dr. Williams. You work with children, of course, a little bit older, um, but what age do you think is appropriate for a child to start handling a gun? I would say the same age that they can operate a motor vehicle. I mean, let's be clear, nine years old in this particular instance. You know, I agree with Dee Dee slightly in this, in this regard. What the uh, story that's coming out is that the recoil is what caused the mm -hmm. weapon yes. to... So a nine-year-old female does not have the capacity to control that. The instructor should have known that. But at the same time, the state has an obligation to step in and say, let's set parameters here developmentally, uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically. Kids are not capable of handling weapons of this regard. Why not have ammunition in there that's non-lethal? I mean, again, there are a lot of things about this, this story that are problematic, but for me, mostly, it's just a failure across the board. And it certainly puts a spotlight on, a, on the growing gun tourism business, which is across the board, especially in the Southwest here in the United States. Um, you have uh, tourists coming in from, from Japan and from all over the world to go shoot these types of weapons. Does, does that surprise you? Because I, I was not quite aware that it had grown to that level. I think, I think people are fascinated with, with the uh, rugged individualism and, and how Americans have the right to bear arms and in these other countries, they are not able to arm themselves. So they're fascinated with it. And actually, that's a pride thing. It makes me proud to be American, you know, that, that we have that tradition. Do you think that it, perhaps, this is just a, a theory, perhaps, um, that we do have more gun violence, um, is that perhaps one of the reasons why that there is this fascination here in America with guns? Um, if we regulate possession and we regulate ownership, there's no reason why the state or the individual states shouldn't and can't regulate persons who actually are shooting and using guns under any circumstances, especially when we're dealing with minors. There is a state interest that we all recognize in ensuring that our children are protected against themselves, against others, and against uh, uh, dangerous situations. And that's exactly what we have here. And, and we talk about background checks, but we don't know the, the mental state of a child also. And again, you work with kids, Dr. Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in this case, we don't know what this nine-year-old, I mean, should she be out playing with something other than an Uzi? Well, we know now she's going to be emotionally scarred as a result of this. So let's, let's be clear. We have incidents like this all the time in the United States where kids find guns and accidentally shoot one another. This is very different because the parents have given the permission. They're out in Arizona for the purpose uh, of, of fun, of recreation. Of 
basically. But, but I, I have a hard time looking at shooting of weapons as being a recreational sport. Again, you're not from Kentucky, and you're not from West Virginia, you're not from Indiana. It is for us. We started early. We were little kids with guns, so I get this. Well, but that's but not the importance. That's not the important yes, thing, it whether it's I a mean, recreation or not. The question is, is whether or not there's an obligation to ensure that it's safe. And I agree there's absolutely an obligation to ensure that it's safe. And that is the problem here. And here, the primary responsibility was the parents. Why would a parent ever give a child who is that young an Uzi to play well, with? Well, the, they're their parents. I mean, that's their prerogative. But this was a business. I think it's well, more on the it, business. It, and let me just throw a few uh, stats out. 21 states have no laws um, allow with children who can uh, operate these types of uh, weapons. Um, 30 states allow a child to own a rifle under the age of 14. So yeah. there's, uh, to your point, uh, many of the states do not have any regulations. It's a culture. I mean, it's rifles just different. Are, but a rifle is a very different weapon. Different weapon. It doesn't different. have the same recoil. Again, when Didi mentions the uh, right to bear arms, of course, there's a historic component to that as well. And in those states that you mentioned, Kentucky, Indiana, uh, uh, history of hunting and so on and so forth, that mm -hmm. I don't think people want to take away. But high-powered weapons of war? A little too much. And certainly it would be an interesting study to see the fascination with some of these young men, especially young men who get these high-powered rifles afterwards and want to own them. Um, one last question, because we do have a couple of different uh, subjects we want to talk about. What do you think the NRA is thinking on this, Dee Dee? And I'm going to let you handle this one. Well, they're supportive. I mean, because, you know, and in fact, there was, there was something out about, uh, they were talking about how you can have fun with guns <laughs> and how, you know, talking about how instead of having a bullseye, that you have like a zombie where you shoot the zombie. You know, no, they're all for it. They're always about uh, handling guns and understanding guns as early as possible. Dee Dee, supportive of what, though? Guns. The question I mean, is, the right is to bear arms, but they amendment. can't be supportive of guns being placed in the hands of persons who don't they're know how to use them. They're supportive of the right to bear arms. And you know what? Look, this business screwed up. So don't blame the guns. Blame do, the business. Do you think Nobody's if she was handling a, just a handgun versus an Uzi, I think that's really, I think it was shocking to see a nine-year-old in pink shorts handling an Uzi. I, I'm not sure, that, but I think that the sentiment across the country was, was more on that line. Do you think we would have seen this case um, if, if it was a handgun? Gun. No, because the guy wouldn't have died. I mean, because you're not going to have the recoil. I mean, if you got a handgun, it would have been fine. So, you know, yeah, I mean, the gun, uh, Uzi's a very powerful weapon, but he did not handle it correctly. Let's be clear. This is not a Second Amendment issue. This is an issue that deals with parental controls and the training of instructors with respect to people who are minors. The question that's raised here, and I think it's an important one, that is, what do we let our children do? It is not a Second Amendment issue. It is an issue concerning protecting our children from disaster. Well, of course, I disagree completely with you, and so do a lot of Americans. That is is a Second Amendment issue. It's All up right. for you to tell parents to tell their kids what to do. This is going to be, I'm sure, a debate that we're going to continue. So we're going to go on to our next subject because we do want to do an update on the latest from Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, the city of 21,000 continues to make headlines around the world. Michael Brown was laid to rest this week, but the city is still in turmoil. This week, five plaintiffs filed a $40 million federal lawsuit slamming the police department. Will more plaintiffs Plaintiffs join in, Mr. Levy. I'll let you uh, start off on that one. Do you do you see more uh, plaintiffs joining in on this case? Yes, I do. I think that the situation uh, in Ferguson was such that I would anticipate that persons, as they recognize that they have rights uh, that they want to exercise with respect to redress in the courts, are going to either join this lawsuit or bring their own. And of course, let's talk about the biggest issues in this lawsuit. Uh, were Michael Brown's civil rights violated. That would be one of the top questions. Um, and also, was the police officer justified in, in using uh, lethal force? The lawsuits that were filed do not involve Michael Brown's rights. They involve the rights of those persons that are alleged to have been assaulted by police during the course of the rioting that was going on. Yes, yes. No, that, cor that of course, yes. The, with respect to Michael Brown's rights, that's the subject of the Justice Department right. investigation that's going on. But in, but in terms of these uh, five plaintiffs, they're saying their civil rights. That's exactly right. And the question is, and I think that um, all of us probably agree, that the um, complaint that alleges $40 million worth of damages seems to far allege far more damages than might be reasonably suspected under the circumstances. You're talking about tobacco litigation damages when you say $40 million. Persons who were aggrieved by reason of um, deaths 
sticks. For the, uh, we're, you know, we're talking here in Ferguson of persons who allege that their civil rights were violated, but the question now is, what are the damages that they're alleging, and where are they? And, and of course, uh, you're an attorney, and, and you're a professor, and, and Didi, you've been on uh, all sorts of uh, TV channels and, and have listened to a lot of different cases. Um, do you think that in this particular case that the police department has been found guilty far too quickly? There are two officers, one of which was discharged the other day, the other has resigned. Um, it's not that they have been found guilty, but in the public opinion, I think that there is a patina that has been cast on the officers and the police department that might suggest a pattern of practice here, which are going to be part of that lawsuit. And Dr. Williams? I couldn't agree more, and I think one of the things that we're seeing here is a situation where this is a statement lawsuit, and essentially you have the plaintiffs in this case adjoining with the attorney and saying, we, we recognize that these damages are excessive, but we want to make the point that what happened here was a violation of, of people's civil liberties. One of the cases involves a woman who was in a McDonald's restaurant and a police officer told her to shut up. She refused to do so because her child was in the restroom. She was arrested and her uh, minor son was arrested too. So the community, these people, these six plaintiffs are saying, look, this is really about the treatment of African Americans of black and brown bodies in public spaces and we're making this a statement because we want to make this part of the public record and get people talking about it and that's exactly what we're doing um, and in terms of um, the grand jury uh, in just in terms of as we move forward um, Mr. Levy this is uh, certainly your expertise um, they're gonna have to decide whether and uh, whether a crime was convicted just to talk us through what we're gonna be seeing in the next couple of weeks and months okay, I prosecuted and presented cases to grand jurors and the t question is whether or not there's probable cause to believe that a crime was committed and that the officer committed the crime. I have thought from the beginning, once we heard that there was a tape recording of shots being fired, that the critical element here is going to be what did the officer say before he knew there was a recording? Because the issue to be presented not only to the grand jury but a subsequent trial is was the officer's conduct reasonable? What did he think? What did he believe? And credibility is going to be key. And that if his story, at the time that he gave it, prior to the tapes of the gunshots, is consistent, it's going to be a long way to enhance his credibility. If it's inconsistent, it's going to be a long way to show that he may not be credible. And we're certainly still waiting for the ballistics report as well. Um, very quick question. We asked this question last week. Uh, the prosecutor in the case, should he recuse himself? He's very close, to, as you know, to the uh, police department. A lot of people are calling for him to step down. In New Jersey, for example, the prosecutor is the chief law enforcement agent of the county. I don't believe that in this case that there's been anything to suggest that this prosecutor should step down simply because he deals with police. That's his job. The okay. question is, is whether or not he can continue to do his job under these circumstances. And hold that thought. We have, our, uh, we have one more thing we want to talk about in this segment. Uh, we also want to mention that the Boston bombing suspect's sister was charged this week with making a bomb threat. Um, just uh, We were talking about New Jersey, another New Jersey <laughs> incident here, Dr. Williams, but uh, certainly uh, pretty shocking to hear this. Shocking, although once you read the story and you kind of look at what's happening here, it looks like a terroristic threat and a, a, probably a disagreement with, between two women that got out of hand. Of course, because of the history of the Sarnia brothers and what's going on now with the trial, the police should take this seriously. But for all intents and purposes, this, this may be magnified simply because of the history associated with her brothers. And we also want to mention that her brother, uh, the, one of those uh, the suspects, he, they are asking to delay his trial until 2015. Um, and they're saying that the prosecutors have been slow to get some of the evidence. Uh, do you think that's, Mr. Levy, i uh, ask you very quickly if you can ask a, uh, answer that question. Do you think that's a, a good idea? I think that seems to be an excessive amount of time to be able to produce evidence between now and then after the nature of the investigation that's been conducted. And I know that has in also infuriated quite a few people to think that this guy is going to be sitting there waiting to have his case presented. Well, how about do it yesterday and then send him to Guant Guantanamo or hang him high? Or, I mean, come, give me a break. I mean, that's a ridiculous amount of time. And, I, and, and for what they did and what, no. There's All also right, a right to a speedy right trial. Mr. Levy, thank Very you speedy. So, <laughs> hang on one second. We're going to take a quick break. Now, with all the turmoil around the world from Syria, Iraq, and the Ukraine, many are wondering how jittery it will make Wall Street. When we come back, we'll talk about whether investors can weather the storm. We'll be right back, everyone.